godfather of European populism, down to the wire in France, and Jeff Sessions' war on weed. French officials say policemen were deliberately targeted in a shooting in Paris's central Champs-Élysées shopping district that left one officer dead and others wounded. Police then killed one of the attackers. President Francois Hollande said he's all but certain the attack is terrorism-related and is holding an emergency defense council meeting tomorrow morning. Nous sommes convaincus que les pistes qui peuvent conduire à l'enquête et qui devront révéler toute la vérité sont d'ordre terroriste. The Islamic State claimed responsibility. General Motors is vowing to take all legal actions against the Venezuelan government after state authorities seized the GM factory there without warning. That forced the company to stop all operations and lay off 2,700 people. Venezuela's auto industry has come to a standstill amid political and economic chaos that has led to violent protests. Despite already having a notoriously tough immigration system, Australia announced new rules today, making it even more difficult to become a citizen. They include speaking English well, being a permanent resident for four years, and passing a new test on Australian values. We need to ensure that our citizenship test enables applicants to demonstrate how they have integrated into and engaged with our Australian community. A wave of tourists is flooding this small Newfoundland town, rushing to see a huge iceberg that just lodged offshore. The stretch of coast has earned the nickname Iceberg Alley because icebergs from the Arctic drift past every spring. This one's especially attention-grabbing. It's 150 feet tall. Homeland Security Chief John Kelly and Attorney General Jeff Sessions toured Border Patrol operations in Texas and gave a few specifics on the administration's plans to stop illegal immigration. At DHS, we're working to expand our detention capacity and pro process immigration cases as close to the border as is humanly possible. In just three days, French voters will go to the polls for the first round of a presidential election that could decide the future of Europe. And just a few points separate the four leading candidates. Marine Le Pen, a far-right anti-immigration nationalist who wants France out of the EU. Francois Fillon, a center-right Republican who's been indicted on charges of embezzlement and corruption. Jean-Luc Mélenchon, a far-left candidate who wants to take France out of NATO. And Emmanuel Macron, a young centrist whose party didn't even exist a year ago. Analysts are predicting a second round showdown between Le Pen and Macron. But almost one third of French voters say they still don't know who they're going to vote for in an election that was already wildly unpredictable, even before today's apparent terror attack. Emmanuel Macron is a 39-year-old former Rothschild banker who's won broad support as a centrist maverick, promising to breathe new life into French politics. Dimanche, nous allons gagner, et ce sera le début d'une nouvelle France. But this rogue outsider is backed by some of the most powerful and influential figures in the French business and political establishment. Jacques Attali, a heavyweight opinion maker in the French political world, was once Macron's mentor. He's an outsider in, in, in to the political system, or so he's been pitched, and yet he has the support of someone like you. Is he really not just an establishment ca candidate? He's embodying everything which should have been done and not have been done by the establishment. Then the establishment maybe have, if I look at it from outside, a kind of guilt complex to see someone who maybe, have, maybe be bold enough to do what they didn't dare to do. It. Establishment backing may not have helped Macron. Veteran far-left candidate Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who is promising to revolutionize the political system, tax the mega-rich at 90% and take France out of NATO, has made a late run and is now polling just a few points behind Macron. Mélenchon casts the media as part of the elite, 
and prefers to talk directly to voters through YouTube broadcasts, including a regular live chat show. Il est extrêmement important de comprendre qu'on est dans un processus qu'on a appelé de révolution citoyenne, c'est-à-dire de récupération du pouvoir. Raquel Garrido is his lawyer and spokesperson. Would I be oversensitive to intuit a sort of hostility to the mainstream media among the Mélenchon campaign, or...? Well, yes, well, the, we understood that the media plays a role, and in this case, it wasn't playing the correct role in giving out uh, information on the programs. So what we're trying to um, do is to better the quality of democracy by putting much more information out there to public scrutiny, because the mainstream media are not doing that. What do you put down this late kind of whiz up the polls? How do you explain that? Well, first, I don't think, it, I, I, I don't really believe that it's, it's that sudden. I think that it's been there, but it was kind of invisible to some people, and especially to the pollsters mm -hmm. that have, I think, um, a hard time understanding those, those big populations that, that um, actually are disgusted by politics. This is now a very close race of four horses hoping to pull France in very different directions. Alors, il est où le camarade Ah bah oui, en effet, il a vraiment souffert, oui. On n'est pas tout à fait tranquille, hein, les résultats de ce matin. On a eu hein, ce matin un, un, donc une, une, une enquête d'opinion qui est la plus complète, qui donnait Macron à 23%, euh, Le Pen à 22,5%. Fillon à 19,5 et Mélenchon à 19. Oui, alors on, est, on, est, on y croit, mais on sait aussi qu'il y a un risque. So what is at stake in this election? C'est vraiment l'orientation de la France. Soit euh, on, on reste un des pays de tête en Europe et dans le monde, on est la cinquième économie mondiale. Soit on est un pays qui euh, décroche un peu et qui va être un pays moyen avec des difficultés euh, un peu récurrentes. It's not just France where a wave of anti-immigration populist candidates are in serious contention. Across Europe, the political establishment is in a state of shock. But one European leader was ahead of the curve, former Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi. Berlusconi essentially wrote the Donald Trump playbook. A media-savvy real estate mogul turned populist campaigner, he mobilized voter sentiment against immigrants and used his personal charisma to brush off scandals about his taxes and his personal life. Even today, at the age of 80, he's popular enough to consider mounting a comeback. In the first in a series of world leader sit-downs, Vice Founder Shane Smith met with Berlusconi at his opulent home outside Milan. Ciao, Presidente. Va bene? Yes, thank you so much. No, le jardin c'est très long, c'est un kilomètre. Ah, il oui. ah. y a le football, ah, oui. le, le champ Track. de football, le tennis, et il y a des fleurs partout. Je fais ici une demi-heure, oui. et puis je passe pour le sauna. Ici, j'ai sur une poule, un jacuzzi, sauna, vapeur. C'est quoi cette photo Ça, Cette photo, c'est ensemble pour la paix. Putin Bush. Et toi Maï, j'étais l'autre. Et l'autre, j'étais jeté. Si Poutine aime Donald Trump, guess what, folks? That's called an asset, not a liability. You have a very good, close personal relationship. You're friends with Putin. What do you think about the American Russian relations? And what do you think of Putin? And what do you think of Trump? Io penso dobbiamo fare di tutto per riportare la Russia nell'Occidente. Vladimir Putin è un leader eccezionale. Io sono legato da un'amicizia fraterna a lui e lo conosco per quello che è realmente. È il contrario dell'immagine che i media di tutto il mondo gli hanno creato addosso. Mr. Putin ha un grande rapporto con i cittadini russi. Lui vince le elezioni con una grande quantità di voti ed è amato dalla sua gente. Quando io e Putin siamo scesi nelle vie della Crimea, siamo stati circondati dai cittadini della Crimea che lo baciavano, le signore anziane che piangevano. Grazie Vladimir, siamo ritornati a casa. 
Mr. Trump non lo conosco, non l'ho mai incontrato. Credo di sapere perché gli americani l'hanno scelto. Donald Trump è entrato per molti anni come star della televisione nelle case degli americani e è diventato qualcuno a cui si dà del tu. Come gli italiani mi chiamano Silvio, lui lo chiamano Donald. Io desidero che Mr. Trump e Mr. Putin possono incontrarsi, capirsi e diventare amici tra di loro come io ero riuscito a far diventare amici Mr. George Bush e Mr. Putin. Io penso che ci sia davvero la possibilità di un accordo tra gli Stati Uniti d'America e la Federazione Russa che coinvolga anche l'Europa. In accordance with the wishes of the British people, the United Kingdom is leaving the European Union. Right now we seem to be taking a step to the right. The globally and in Europe and in America we're taking a step to the right. And you look at what happened in Austria recently, a far right party came second but nearly came first. And now you have the rise of the far right in Germany. Is Europe worried? Should Europe be worried about this sort of rise of the far right in sì. Austria? Guardi, intanto queste destre sono messe tutte insieme nel populismo e sono le sinistre che trattano con distanza, con snobismo questi fenomeni, perché questi fenomeni hanno delle ragioni che corrispondono alle paure, alla rabbia, alle esigenze di una vasta porzione di cittadini e quindi votano contro l'establishment, se aumentano sino ad arrivare al potere. Il primo risultato sarebbe il venire fuori dall'Europa e quindi la distruzione della unità europea. Marine Le Pen, up until recently, was the front runner in the French presidential elections. What happens to Europe if she wins in France uh, and what happens if indeed France leaves the EU? Sarebbe una penalizzazione grande per l'Europa. L'uscita della Gran Bretagna ha mutilato l'Unione Europea ed è stata per noi e io credo anche per loro una gran perdita. Se fosse orfana anche della Francia l'Europa andrebbe verso una fine molto negativa. Immigration is affecting France, immigration is affecting Italy, immigration is affecting Germany, Eastern Europe, even the UK. How much is it affecting Italian politics? But even larger, how much is this affecting politics in Europe? È un problema epocale. Nessun paese al mondo può sopportare una immigrazione che può essere così elevata nei numeri. Le economie europee non sono in grado di offrire posti di lavoro a questi nuovi arrivi perché chi arriva e non lavora ruba, delinque, vende le droghe, prostituzione, furti negli appartamenti per vivere. L'Europa faccia una specie, chiamiamo, voi lo conoscete bene, di piano Marshall per i paesi interessati che non sono delle democrazie. Io penso che soltanto con un'azione di questo tipo l'Europa possa fermare una immigrazione di massa che porterebbe nell'Europa stessa uno sconvolgimento totale. Forza Italia, forza di libertà! Do you run in the next election? Do you, do you, do you come back uh, to take the reins of power in Italy? Io sarò in campo per la campagna elettorale, anche se non sarò candidabile. Spero di poter essere candidato. Ecco, quello che noi vogliamo fare in Italia è una grande rivoluzione liberale, con le radici nei nostri valori occidentali, nella democrazia, nella libertà, nel cristianesimo. Ho preparato un programma molto concreto in sei punti che sono meno tasse, meno Stato, meno Europa, con più aiuto a chi ha bisogno, 
più sicurezza per tutti legata al problema dell'immigrazione e una riforma della giustizia che è la cosa più importante in Italia. Ecco, le ho spiegato anche il sistema con cui io spero di conquistare la fiducia della maggioranza degli italiani. Mr. Berlusconi, grazie mille per il suo tempo oggi. Welcome. Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos toured a school in Ohio today, and she did it in surprising company. DeVos stood side by side with one of her worst enemies, Randy Weingarten, the head of one of the country's largest teachers' unions. Antonia Hilton reports. In America's long-running education battle, there are two bitterly opposed sides. Randy Weingarten and Betsy DeVos are the literal embodiments of the two. Weingarten is a former teacher and career-long labor activist who now runs the American Federation of Teachers. Her members deeply oppose most changes to the way American public education works. Betsy DeVos is a billionaire whose previous job was running a private investment firm. In her spare time, she advocated for quote-unquote school choice, using public money for alternatives to public schools, like charters and voucher programs. Those are some of the teachers' union's least favorite things. When President Trump nominated DeVos for Secretary of Education, Weingarten belittled her as a wealthy heiress and put out a statement saying that DeVos would destroy public education in America. Today, the two are appearing together at Weingarten's invitation. There's a long tradition in Washington of working with your enemy, and not necessarily for high-minded reasons. First, breaking bread with your arch rival makes you look mature and open to new ideas and willing to speak truth to power. In reality, it gives you cover to dig in even harder on the things your core supporters believe in, because you gave the other side a chance. Expect both DeVos and Weingarten to make reference to meeting each other as they push their own agendas going forward. What makes this event feel so out of the ordinary is that the Trump administration has done so little of it. You don't see EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt sitting down with the Sierra Club. That served to isolate the administration, and it gives its opponents more leeway to be critical. So DeVos's ceasefire could be a kind of pilot program for her colleagues in the cabinet. If it ends up working well for her, they'll start doing it too. Campaigns between allies make for hard feelings, which is why there's a special tradition for what happens afterwards, the unity rally. After the tough race for chairman of a Democratic National Committee, Democrats are holding a series of unity rallies across the country this week. Tom Perez, the new DNC chair, and Bernie Sanders, a fierce critic of the DNC, are appearing together on stage. But things are not going according to plan. It is now my great honor and privilege to present to you my friend, Senator Bernie Sanders! The third stop of the DNC's Come Together and Fight Back Tour brought Tom Perez and Bernie Sanders together in Miami. It sounds to me like you guys are ready to make a political revolution. These two were not buddies a couple of months ago. Sanders fought hard to keep Perez from winning the DNC chairmanship. And Perez was a strong supporter of Hillary Clinton during the Democratic presidential primary. On stage, Bernie mentioned Perez only once and didn't defend him when some of his supporters in the crowd booed. Let me thank Tom Perez for his remarks. As Democratic unity rallies go, this was a weird one. The DNC hosted it, but it looked like a Bernie rally, full of outsiders. And some of the biggest applause lines came when the senator criticized Democrats. Donald Trump did not win the election. The Democrats lost the election. But if Perez thought this whole thing is a little odd, he didn't show it. Only one of the two of you is calling yourself a Democrat on this tour, and that's you. How does that make you feel as the Democratic Party chair? Well, you know what? We're working to earn the support of everyone. And Well, that includes uh, Bernie. I, I, are, you, are you working on him on the sidelines? Well, you know what? We, 
I, I really believe that when we put our values into action, and when we, when at the end of the day, when people start to see that the Democratic Party is fighting for the identical set of things that we're fighting for, uh, that's the definition of victory. But Democratic unity isn't really on Sanders' agenda. Well, it's not a Democratic Party event per se, but this okay. is an event where Tom Prez is speaking and I am speaking. So is the party that Tom Perez is leading doing the right things to make those people of come into the system? Of course they have not done. The, the, because the Democratic Party has not done the right thing. That's the reason why Donald Trump is president. So what are we to make of this tour? The press coverage has been skeptical. Right-wing media is having a field day with each new video clip of the DNC chair being booed at a DNC event. What have you learned so far about maybe what needs to change in your party? Well, we need to make sure we're speaking to everyone. We need to make sure we have a 12-month operation. Sanders wants Democrats to sound more like him. He wants to change the party from the outside. This tour for him is a chance to show that that idea might be catching on. You tell me, do you think that two years ago, the chairman of the Democratic Party would be traveling with me around the United States of America? I mean... No. I don't remember you being a lot on the tours before. <laughs> <laughs> the world is changing, and for the right reasons. Bernie says there's a ways to go before he's happy. Does anybody not believe that we need a total change, restructuring of the Democratic Party? And that's what I'm here to do, to say to people, get involved in the party. Is there a reception? Are Democrats receptive to that message? Some are, some aren't. What about Tom Perez? Well, there's Tom Perez. evaluate the rules, I feel like that uh, I am, uh, I should not be involved in this. Attorney General Jeff Sessions thinks America is in the throes of a bad person epidemic. That good people don't smoke marijuana. According to a 2016 Gallup poll, 33 million Americans acknowledge current marijuana use, and 43% have tried the drug. And a CBS News poll released today shows 76% of 18 to 34-year-olds support legalization of marijuana. But Sessions is an old-school law and order conservative, a drug war dead-ender. We need grown-ups in charge in Washington to say marijuana is not the kind of thing that ought to be legalized. It's a view that Sessions has held for his entire career in public service. In 1996, while serving as Alabama's attorney general, he pushed legislation that would impose a mandatory death penalty on twice convicted marijuana dealers. During his confirmation hearing, Sessions told Vermont Senator Pat Leahy that he didn't recall recommending the gallows for pot selling Alabamans. Well, I'm not sure under what circumstances I said that, but uh, I don't think that sounds like something I would normally say. We're glad to look at it. Would, but, you, uh, would you say that's not your view today? It is not my view today. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Sessions' views may have softened, but he still vigorously argues that Americans underestimate the dangers of marijuana consumption. And weed smokers indulge in a drug only, quote, slightly less awful than heroin. The science might not support such a claim, but Sessions did marshal some anecdotal evidence. Lady Gaga said she's addicted to it and is not harmless. But in a number of states, it's legal. Sessions, usually an advocate of devolving power to the states, has a rather different view when it comes to marijuana policy. Marijuana is against federal law, and that applies in states where they may have repealed their own anti-marijuana laws. While Sessions' views on the harmfulness of marijuana might seem stuck in the previous century, his position that federal drug laws supersede state law are in line with all the attorneys general who preceded him. Do you support legalization of marijuana? Senator, I do not. Would the federal law preempt states who are trying to legalize the substance? With respect to the marijuana enforcement laws, it is still the policy of the administration and certainly would be my policy, if confirmed as attorney general, to continue enforcing the marijuana laws. Sessions is promising to expand the drug war and would retreat from his battle against marijuana under one important condition. The United States Congress has made the possession of marijuana in every state and distribution of it an illegal act. So if that's something is not desired any longer, Congress should pass a law to change the rule. Today is 420, the day when people who like to get high defy federal laws against getting high by getting extra high. 
And humans aren't the only ones who enjoy a little recreational substance abuse. Presented here, the druggies of the animal kingdom. Jaguars microdose by nibbling on vines that contain an element of ayahuasca. Siberian reindeer eat so many magic mushrooms that their urine is psychoactive. Bees prefer mainstream uppers like caffeine and nicotine, but are serious hardliners about booze. Any hive member that comes home with a high blood alcohol content is murdered. Dolphins will disable and pass around a blowfish, whose toxic venom induces a trance-like state, though they use the drug mainly in social settings. Wallabies have become a problem for Australia's legal opium farmers, often leaving crop circles and poppy fields after binging on seeds and getting too high to hop straight. Lemurs rub themselves with poisonous millipedes, whose secretions help repel dangerous parasites and insects, but also get the animals noticeably stoned, like so many Americans are today. That's Vice News Tonight for Thursday, April 20th. Tune in tomorrow night for the award-winning documentary series, Vice. You see McDonald's is not as much as mosques, but you see it quite a lot, like, there's fast food everywhere, yo. Have any of you had health concerns, do you think, as a result of this? Have you ever delivered to the same person twice in one day? Yes. Yeah, sometimes it happened three times. <laughs>